OK, so what are the properties of this thing that's making Sirius go in a circle? So what do we know? Well, we have Sirius. We know it has a mass m1 is about twice the mass of the sun, so that's about 4 by 10 to the 30 kilograms. And it's going in a circle. And we know the radius of the circle is about 7 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun, so an AU is about 1.5 by 10 to the 11 meters. Actually, the orbit is not a circle, it's an ellipse, but we're going to approximate it as a circle to make the maths a bit easier. The answer will come out pretty close to the right one. So, what can make a star move in a circle? Presumably, we've got Sirius, and there's a centre of mass of the system, and then somewhere on the other side of that centre of mass is our mystery object. And we've got M1 here, R1 there, R2 here, which may, may be larger than R1 as I've drawn here, or maybe smaller, we don't know. And we've got some unknown mass, M2. And what we want to work out is what the mass of the second object is, and we're probably going to have to find out how far out it is as well. So how can we do that? Well, there are two unknowns, the mass of the second object and how far out it is, so we're going to need two equations. The first equation comes from the definition of the centre of mass. If you have any system, it always orbits around the centre of mass. And the definition of centre of mass is that m1r1 equals m2r2. So if the subject is heavier, this distance will be smaller. If it's lighter, it'll have to be further away to balance out. So this is just like a, uh, a scales or balance or a seesaw or something like that. If the weight is small, it must be far out to balance a big weight close in. So that tells us uh, some idea of what the mass must be. If, for example, R1 and R2 are the same, so they're orbiting around a point halfway between, then the masses must be the same. If M2 is twice as far away, it must be half as massive. But by itself, that doesn't solve the problem. It simply tells us for a given r what the m is, but we don't know which actual combination is the right one. So what else can we do? Well, if Sirius is moving in a circle at some velocity v, for anything, in fact, to move in a circle with velocity v, there has to be a centripetal force towards the middle. I'll call that force centripetal. Whenever anything moves in a circle, it's accelerating. While its speed may be the same, its velocity, which is a vector, is changing because it's changing in direction. And that force is equal to mv squared over r. Or in this case, that's m1v1 squared over r1. So these are all properties of Sirius. So we can work out what that force is, because we know the mass of Sirius. What's its velocity? Well, we don't know the velocity, but we know that it goes in a complete orbit every 50 years. That's the orbital period. Now, the period is going to be the distance it has to travel, which is the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi r1 over the velocity it's traveling at. So the velocity is therefore just 2 pi r1 over the period. OK, so we can calculate this, but what's supplying that force? Something has to be supplying this force to make it go in a circle. That's the nature of centripetal force. It's not a real force. You can't be hit by a centripetal force. It's just that force that you need to make something go in a circle. It has to be supplied by something else. If you're spinning a, a string around your head, it'll be the tension in the, in the string. In this case, it must be gravity that's doing it. So this must be equal to the gravitational force. So we get that the centripetal force that we need, m1v1 squared over r1, 
is equal to the gravitational force of the mystery object on Sirius. Now, gravitational force is given by Newton's law of gravity, so it's g m1 m2 over the distance between them squared. The distance between them is r1 plus r2, all squared. So that's our second equation. We can cancel the mass of Sirius in this. And so once again, we have an equation which relates the mass of the mystery object to how far out it is. So what do we do now? Well, we could combine these two equations, substitute, say, this one into that one, and solve for the answer. The trouble is, that gives us a cubic equation, one that's in either r cubed or mass cubed, which is um, a bit painful to solve. Perfectly solvable. You can plug it into a symbolic mass program and get the answer out, but it'll be long and messy, and it's beyond the scope of this course. However, we can estimate the answer by drawing a graph. Let's rearrange this to get M2. So we get that M2 is V1 squared over R1 squared times R1. What I've done is I've multiplied top and bottom by R1 for reasons to become clear in a moment. R1 plus R2 squared over G. But we know that the velocity is given by this. We know that V1 over R1 equals 2 pi over P. So we can substitute that into here. That's why I put the squared on both sides. We just square the entire thing. And so we find that M2 is 4 pi squared over g times the period squared r1 r1 plus r2 squared. Okay, so we have two equations. We have this equation, which can be rearranged as m2 equals m1 r1 over r2. So it's an equation for m2 as a function of r1. And we have another equation for m2 as a function of r1. So we can plot a graph. So if we plot the value of m2 against an assumed value of r2. So let's have this in astro astronomical units. So we'll go uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. And over here we'll have the mass in units of 10 to the 30 kilograms. That's 10 to the 30. 2 by 10 to the 30. 3 by 10 to the 30. Okay, so if we plot this equation, we'll see that as R2 goes up, the mass is larger. That makes sense, because we're looking at this equation is telling us how big the mystery object must be to apply the necessary force, and if it's further away, it has to be more massive to apply the necessary force. So we can plug the numbers into here. Remember to convert R from astronomical units into meters, convert period from years, 50 years, into seconds. Um, the gravitational constant, 6.67 by 10 to the minus 11. And we get a graph, we get a, for, uh, five astronomical units, we get a point something like that. 10 astronomical units, it's something like this. 15, it's up around here. 20, it's up around there some sort of curve like this. So the mystery object, if it's far away, would have to weigh two times the mass of the sun. If it's close in, it would be less than half the mass of the sun. Then we can take the other equation, this one here, and plot that. So if R2 is uh, five astronomical units, then that gives us a uh, 
a mass way up here. Uh, if it's 10, it's down about there. Once again, just plugging the numbers in. 15, it's something around here. 20, it's going something like that. So in this case, we're looking at the center of mass. So if the second object is far out, it has to be lighter. And so what you can see is the two curves meet somewhere like that. So the second object, whatever it is, must be somewhere between 10 and 15 astronomical units from the center of mass and has a mass of about 2 by 10 to the 30 kilograms, which is about the mass of the sun. So we're talking about something about the mass of the sun orbiting Sirius.